other than they're still working on it. Yeah. All right. Uh, 821. Uh, we wanted to bring uh, former Governor uh, Eddie Cabo onto the show to just, uh, you know, of course, uh, value the perspective. Uh, good morning, Gov. Hey, good morning. Good morning. day, Chris and Sabrina. Hi. Well, I, wow. um, I am listening and I've been enjoying the show. In fact, I, I was listening to my old friend and fellow class of 79 graduate, Polly, uh, Paul Guffigan, do his blessing. And I took some of that blessing since I'm a graduate of the governor's school. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> and so I wanted to get any blessing I could do. So thank you, Father and friend, pa- Father Paul. Hey, I'll take any blessing I could get, uh, <laughs> yeah. too. Hey, you know, I I did want to give my perspective. Thank you for calling me. Remember, you you guys called me when this thing all started. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was me. And and, yeah, I, I, if you can recall some of the issues. Now, you know, we're we're a few months into this thing, and and from what I appears, I remember I'm I'm a graduate, so I'm not there. I'm not in the same shoes. But from the perspective I see, I was a little nervous, and I don't know if you remember in the beginning when I said, "Hey, you know, one of the things that that was a little surprising." was that in the governor's state of the island address and you know i didn't see it but i did read the text of it and i think i commented to you guys at the beginning how little mention there was on the pandemic right yeah. and I, I mean she the the governor did mention uh that we were dengue fever free and i and i read there was about a paragraph on hey we got a pandemic plan but we don't have any uh coronavirus but at that same time I was looking at the news, and that's why I was I was a little concerned that there was not more brought up in the state of the island. That same period, that same week, is when Korea just put the highest emergency alert uh, in regards to the health condition of the country as a result of the contagion of the of the coronavirus COVID nineteen from China to South Korea. I was that was a, that was the first country after China that was getting hit. And folks, you think about it. You get you get about sixty thousand Korean tourists a month coming to Guam. Uh, if that nation is the one that is a, has just declared an emergency because of the pandemic uh, or the Corona COVID nineteen, you would expect that there would be uh, red the red light with the uh, uh, flashing and all hands on deck on what the possible implications. So that was kind of like the first uh, concern that I had that maybe we weren't. Uh, we're running behind and then remember also i commented on two things number one and i think uh, chris you kind of disagreed with me because you know i said it's got to be run concurrently there's number one there is a health issue of this COVID 19 the impacts on guam how do you stop it how do you mitigate it while it's here and how do you how do you you contain it while it's here but then at the same time the economic impact the inc- there, there is the social cost and people getting unemployed, uh, and there is uh, obviously uh, the impact on businesses and what that means to to not only those business folks that run a business and provide services, but you know, there in the end, there's a uh, there's an impact to the government on revenues. You can't do one and the other. You got to do both, and you got to coordinate. So those were kind of my initial thoughts when our first meeting. And if you look at where we're at right now, you you know, you you, you, you know, it kind of. And I hate to be a uh, armchair quarterback. Oh no, please do be. It's okay. You're allowed to be. <laughs> you're you're a graduate, remember? Yeah, you can yeah. you can speak freely, Gov. And I think that's basically what's occurred. We we kind of got behind on this thing. There was a catch up. Um, there's probably I see a little bit of um, even when there's good ideas and, and, and good plans. The implementation seems to be where there's wanting, and you know that's kind of like what we we got to work on now. But yeah. Um, yeah. It, you know, I, I we could go into a lot of different areas, but you know that's my general thoughts on this. Other than we should have been focusing both not only on the health side of things, uh, but also in what the economic impacts were and how we are having a plan to move out of it. It doesn't appear that there. To me, it doesn't appear that there was a plan. Well, I, I mean, I, I kind of got to agree, you know, with they lo- they rolled out this uh, program, the uh, Azura and Salapi Pare Tautau program, and what we were hearing was uh, nobody knew about it in the government of Guam until the governor announced it at the press conference. 
Yeah, and you know that's and that's th- that's kind of been kind of typical gov that we hear. Uh, you know, people at the Joint Information Center they're blindsided by these announcements that are being made at the press conference, and then they're left holding the governor's purse and dealing with and, the calls that are coming in, saying, "Hey, what did the governor say?" And they don't know what to say. I hope you don't mind. I bring up our friend Janella, but um, I, if there's one thing, I, I feel for Oya, my former communications director. Uh, this poor lady was slammed. Uh, at all sides, particularly in an election year. And it appeared that certain reporters were, you know, seemed to be asking questions right out of the Democratic Party playbook. One of them was Janela Carrera, if you can recall. And a couple of times I remember Oya trying to, you know, shut her down and said, no, let her ask the question. And of course she'd ask a question that seemed to be right out of the uh, Democratic Party commercial and I answered it. So, you know, at the time, um, Janela seemed to hold herself high as a paragon of the uh, uh, was it the fourth or fifth estate, I can't recall what the media and the news it is, but uh, as one that would uh, focus on checks and balances, and it's amazing that that what was uh, what I saw was um, this haughtiness of Janela Carrera back in the day and treating my my communications folks and my directors and me a little bit with a little bit of uh, uh, how would you say for uh, um, self-righteousness uh where they've come to a point where i would i can't believe the kind of uh, uh uh kind of things that are coming out of a communication department in terms of censorship and muting so uh well <laughs> uh, don't throw rocks in a glass house but uh, like <laughs> janella uh better uh, put on some band-aids because uh, she sure should be getting a lot of cuts yeah Ooh. that that's interesting and you know gov i mean <laughs> We've had our run-ins, and I, I, I got to say, you're right, man. If, if there was a question that had to be asked and it was tough, you never yeah. muted. You always answered it. <laughs> I, never mm-hmm. I mean, you I'm pretty sure you wish answer. you could have muted. <laughs> How was my answer, scare Chris? I'm <laughs> what I believe was, you know, hey, another thing, you know, what I'm one of the things is there always is checks and balances. When, when this administration came in and the legislature, remember I told you folks, and the media, the media had to be, they, they had to put on their A game even more than in my time as a governor and also the minority because stepping into an administration and a legislature and a public auditor and a congressional office was all one party. You had a super majority in the legislature, which was Democrat. You had a Democrat administration. You had a Democrat congressman. And you had a very partisan Democrat in the legislature who became public auditor. And at that, I and I told the, the Republican minority folks, you gotta you gotta be there to do checks and balances. And I, I and I reminded even you folks in the media, because it appears now I, I've never heard B.J. Cruz so quiet in my life. Man, the way he used to roll his eyes and and gasp with his and with his uh, yeah, God, his, it's, his, it's... Uh, exaggerated and and you know. He would even foia Benita Maglonia when she was doing two jobs at Guam Memorial Hospital because she was thinking he would think that she was getting paid by Guam Memorial Hospital. Unfortunately, poor Benita was getting paid as a director, which was much less than a CFO. And I think he was disappointed when he found out that she was being paid as a DOA director, but doing two jobs as a DOA director and helping out the hospital. Right. He was actually and disappointed. And we, I, I guess, but I think that's why it's incumbent folks like you, Chris. Uh, and Sabrina, because it appears when I see that, and I, I feel for the Republicans, when you when you see that only meetings of Democrat senators with the governor are being held in Adelope, and you're seeing the censorship of the media, um, you're, 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 it's something very unhealthy and very undemocratic. Yeah. So uh, yeah. it's equally important now for folks to ask the questions and to be the devil's advocate. You know, I, I, I'd like to keep my mouth shut since I am a, a, an ex-governor, but I, I do have a role here as a citizen, and I am still involved in government as I'm a Trump appointee uh, to the White House Advisory Commission on uh, Asian American Pacific Island Affairs. Right. There's a young man in the other radio station, this Logan Rages, that seems to have his nose so far up that as a de- Democratic apologist, both in the local leadership and in, in Washington, I had to call up Tony Lamarina the other day uh, to, to give a balanced view because there's got to be some folks. And again, I'm going to, you know, when it comes to the, the Republican 
administration, which I represent in Washington, um, I've never seen a Republican, a, a, a president do as much for Guam as President Trump. And so I had to put my two cents worth uh, in the other station's radio show yesterday. And I, I, I'd repeat it here today as well. Right. Gov, I want to ask you, um, uh, what do you make of these scandals that have been coming out uh, during this uh, pandemic? Uh, you know, they've really taken away from the efforts uh of, you know, the people who are fighting the spread of the coronavirus. We had, you know, the Tony Babauta scandal. Uh, now, obviously, there's uh, controversy with the uh, procurement uh, for the hotels to be used as GovGuam quarantine and isolation facilities. The cabinet. Uh, the cabinet well, members staffing these uh, hotel quarantine facilities, getting paid a 15% uh, COVID differential pay. Um, obviously, the muting of the media was a big one. Right. It just It just really seems like... It's been just one thing after another, and and how does this affect well, the public confidence in, in government, and you know just the the general uh, response to the coronavirus? Remember, we had a few crises. At the beginning, we had it when I came in. It was a fiscal crisis with the uh, with the three hundred million dollar deficit, the negative uh, cash balances at the bank. We had the North Korean incident, which was um, uh, man, really that hit us hard because our tourism numbers went down to near zero. And it took us two years to recover. That was another fiscal crisis, and then, of course, the 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 the, the issues on the on the um, Trump tax cuts, which were good for the public, but one quarter through the fiscal year caused a tremendous impact in our finances. Plus, a bunch of minor typhoons that really didn't hit us hard. But I remember when it came to numbers, I had a chief of staff in terms of finance who was Bernie Artero. She oversaw basically like Frank Ariola's chief of staff for operations in all that matters, but Bernie Artero was COS for anything that comes to finances and, and the economy. Plus, I get my legal counsel. I got some smart folks like Arthur Clark and Sandy Miller, plus uh, GSA, Claudia Faji. Even leading up to an emergency, when we see that there may be a need for a, a emergency procurement, you get all these folks to come together. And you work out, ensure that your legal requirements, your fiscal your, the the requirements either under federal regulations or local laws are adhered to. And I've never heard of verbal agreement, by the way, as a governor. And I've been 20 years in public office as a senator and a governor. I've never heard of a verbal agreement in any government capacity, which it seems to have occurred uh, uh, in this pandemic. And it seems like the paperwork is catching up after the verbal agreement. That's that's something. I wonder why B.J. Cruz is this quite as he is right now there because he sure would have been yelling when it was my if i was governor mm -hmm. it was a oh man but, but in that end <laughs> you know i have some issues there so it appears that they're they're um, the procurement side of things uh you know the team that should be coming together even beforehand i'm not too sure and of course with a with a, with an emergency especially being with fema you got to get uh, uh homeland security and Office of Civil Defense in there together. And we had that issue with North Korea, mm -hmm. and we had it with FEMA with some of the typhoons. Mm -hmm. But, but so, Gov, you know, um, mm -hmm. we had uh, Carlo Branch on, and he was saying that, well, Title 10 gives the governor these superpowers, although you kind of can hear from the legislature, the same law actually gives the public health authority uh, yeah. superpowers. So I, I'm just kind of, Conf not well no i'm not really confused mm -hmm. but i just want to hear your yeah. take on that does title 10 give you these superpowers or does it give you I, public health I authority remember, I, superpowers I, I remember the pandemic emergency plan that that right. was created in 2008 but man like i said how you cross and make an interpretation into verbal agreements by someone that is not dead and whether it's a governor or a a director of public health but then to pass on and subordinate that power, and then an open interpretation of uh, of, of that power to include verbal agreements. Uh, you know, again, I'm not a lawyer, but that's where I would have had my lawyer. I would have had uh, uh, my GSA, my procurement chief, and Bernie. Uh, I would have had OCD, uh, Office of Civil Defense, and and Homeland Security, um, and I would have our federal counterpart. Uh, coming in and, and talking and, and all of a sudden sitting down and talking right. together. Yeah. Yeah. You Gov know, there's a little different anyway. That's from my perspective. Right. And Gov, I got to say that we've, we've foiled a ton of emails uh, from the governor's uh, legal counsel and, and reading these and still kind of unpacking it, it really looks like 
Um, he was, well, he was calling the shots uh, and arranging all these services uh, without any paperwork. And then after the fact, looping in people like Claudia, looping in, you know, people like the AG's office to say, hey, I need yeah. all this paperwork done yeah. now. Hey, by the way, I, I, and when I was another thing in an emergency, when I first came in, our, 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 the pay of all my, my senior staff in Avalu, um, you know, I actually asked them because we didn't realize how bad the fiscal crisis is. Mm-hmm. I knew that we had to take back the hate plan. We, could, we couldn't increase increment. We were freezing increments. We were freezing hiring. So you know what I told my staff? Hey, guys, can you take a pay cut until we straighten this thing out? Instead, what and, we and, have here is the administration yeah. taking a pay raise with this COVID well, differential I, I pay. I understand because we, I, I asked my folks to take a pay cut, and they did. They took a 10% pay cut. And then this administration comes in, and every one of my special assistants and every one of my appointed officials, it appears that this current administration gave them a 20% increase from what the pay is of my people at the same like positions. So they already coming into office in day one, everyone was paid higher than what my people were being paid. I didn't hear BJ making a yak about it. And, and yet, but I understand the governor said, hey, you know, I got to pay good people good pay to mm. get the right talent in. But as far as I'm concerned, looking at these people, even them a 20% pay hike from what uh, my people were getting, no offense, I think our people did a much better job. And I'm proud of them. And they, they, they took, they, they fell on the sword and took pay cuts as well. So, you know, maybe they should ask for some of my people's help and maybe they should ask Oya because I think Janella and, uh, and Carlo and a bunch of those folks. Uh, I just can't. Ra- and we brought this up with, with Carlo, Gov. It's, uh, you know, I mean, as the communications director, you would think that Janela would be out here more. Uh, she can't even do or she doesn't do interviews with the media, which is, uh, to me, it's, it's crazy. I don't know why uh, every time we need something, uh, we got to go to the policy director. I yeah. figure, you hey, know, Gov- I mean, is it just the title and name? And they got some sharp people there. You know, they, yeah. at least yeah. you know, Governor Gutierrez did. I mean, he did preside over some crises. So, mm-hmm. you know, he has been quiet in this. Only caveat there is, you know, Governor Gutierrez did act and act quick, but Governor Camacho spent all his eight years paying FEMA back uh, for uh, what he called question costs and and uh, and uh, excluded, you know, basically FEMA said he ain't going to pay for this. I mean, we're not going to, we paid you for this, but you didn't follow uh, the, the proper documentation trail and we're going to disallow these costs. I only ended up for the first four of my years paying off <laughs> FEMA. So we had we had eight we had nine ten eleven we had twelve years of Republican governors paying back FEMA for the foibles and mistakes of the last Democratic governor, and I I, I assume uh, going at the rate of these folks, uh, we're going to have the next Republican governor have to pay back <laughs> the mistakes of this current Democratic administration. That's the history of, Democra- of Republican governors having to pay back the feds. For the mistakes of Democrat governors in the past. Man, Gov, I had a, a there, man. I had a comment here. Um, yeah. Ask uh, former Governor Eddie Calvo who is more silent: Attorney General Levin Camacho or Public Auditor B.J. Cruz? Man, they're both quiet. Mm. They're both quiet. That's kind of like I said. That is so why it, it's important and incumbent the media, the news. I'm uh, disappointed in some of the. You guys are hitting hard. Um, I've seen the post hit hard, uh, but I've seen some very weak need folks in the media, both in news and talk show hosts. And, I, and unfortunately, I, I, I've been kind of pushing my Republican uh, minority. And, and hopefully, boy, I, I'm, you know, I, I've seen the Republican minority now getting a lot more louder. And, you know, there are a couple of Democrats. I got, I got a, I, you know, Therese Terlahi. Uh, I, I've always respected the lady, but she's she's putting questions out there. And I don't know, probably Therese wasn't invited to add a loop with those folks either, because she may be out. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> can I just I can ask... Make, it, I can it, make comments like this as an as a graduate of the governor's school. Right, you can. Right, yeah. and, and, and being a graduate of the governor's school, if you were, say you were governor today, and this fell on your, your lap under your watch, would you involve the mayors oh, would you involve oh. the senators would you keep them updated would you let them know hey we've got covid over here we got covid over there you know because that's what we've heard from the mayors is they like last to know but first in the field a bunch of mayors know me i've always put uh, folks even i help put craft legislation to empower the mayors they're the ones at the grassroots level the mayors are the ones 
in that even in that when it's not a crisis they're the ones that are picking up the dead dogs that have run over uh, been run over they're the ones that the first ones when it comes to a to a family abuse where someone is beating up their kid or their wife they're the first ones to get the call and they run in there with the uh, with the uh, social service workers and the police uh, it's important and I think from, so the mayors that are listening they knew how important it was for our administration to bring them in the mayor's council uh, I, I, I'm blessed. I have a bunch of smart people around me. You know, I'm, I'm a normal guy. I never never got A's, uh, but I had a bunch of smart people around me, and uh, I brought all the experts in, uh, and I, with all humility, I took everyone's advice, and I, or I listened to everyone from all their different perspectives, both locally uh, and our federal partners, and then moved quickly. And then had to be decisive, decisive and made a decision, and I... I hope the governor can do the same as well. Get the mm-hmm. right people in there, listen to everybody, then in the end make a decision. Decision. So God bless her. Well, you you know you brought up the pandemic response plan. Um, from what you've seen, uh, are we following this pandemic response plan, or are we going with this Title Ten superpower law and I, running with actually, it? Actually, uh, from what I remember, the pandemic plan. You know, a plan is good. Mm-hmm. I mean, and you know, obviously, some plans need to be. That was made, uh, heck, more than ten years ago. But it's the implementation, and that's where I'm seeing a bunch of stuff. You know, maybe the there's a lack. Of, like I said, you know, for me, I had a chief of staff, I had a uh, uh, financial chief of staff, I had some special assistants, I had Vince Young Guerrero. He he got everyone, and on a regular basis, not even an emergency, he would focus on all the education agencies, UOG, GCC. Department of Education, the private schools. I had Brian St. Nicholas, who was health, public health, this uh, mental health, uh, the private clinics, uh, the hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had uh, Lieutenant Governor Tenorio. Mm. Yeah, but Gov, you also had Lester Carlson and Edward Byrne. And you know, Lester Carlson and Edward Byrne are good. They, you know, let's face it, they've kept this government uh, stable. They're, they're from finance. But they were part of a of, of, a, of a Swiss. I, for me, I call it a Swiss watch. And and you know, in the end, DOA director is DOA director, and he has his responsibility. BBMR director, BBMR director. I had a I had a book, uh, a, a lady, a smart name lady named Bernie or Carol, that was kind of putting everybody together to speak the same language, to to to, to, um, to read the same notes in the music sheet. Uh, and of course, I I oversaw Bernie, and then I coordinated Bernie uh, and the and the and the numbers people, including Gita, to, to try to get a, a real and with GVB to get a armament plan. Let's say in the North Korea incident, uh, and um, all working with my with the lawyers I had up there in in Adelaide, all working there with other special assistants that had you know that, that had certain roles and responsibility. I had a special assistant that focused on on communicating with the mayors and you know um in times of crisis where it was either man-made or natural then it was put in under the auspices of homeland security civil defense and our meetings were not in Adeloupe, but were in uh up there at homeland security uh because there was some sort of danger to the public either man-made uh or by uh, nature I, I just see a little bit of disconnect here i don't know but a little but i just don't see and so even in, in the times of non-emergency, there was this, I had meetings Mondays and Thursdays where I had everyone come in and talk not only the issues on my cabinet, but also on those liaisons, what were the issues on the autonomous agencies? Um, you know, and it includes the utilities. So I, I don't, you know, I don't, I didn't make the framework for this current administration, but I, I do see maybe they have a different organizational structure that it, it may be a little bit more complicated. Gov, uh, we're getting a lot of comments, and this is an issue that Sabrina I, uh, and I have been uh, following, uh, mm. the issue of the double pay uh, during a, a state of emergency. The governor is uh, clearly, I mean, they're, <laughs> they don't want to pay it. All right, and uh, so we people are asking in the comments, what's your take on that? We know you've uh, helmed some disasters, so. Well, you got to do what you got to do. Remember, uh, if it's the law, Remember, I came in, part of the deficit we had, but we also had these laws. Remember the 40% pay increase to the law enforcement? Mm-hmm. Uh, it had to be done. In fact, I don't even know, I can't remember how many lawsuits, but there may have been lawsuits. So 
in the end, part of the restructuring, not only in paying back uh, five years worth of four or five years worth of tax refunds, but hey, there was a law in the books that said there was supposed to be a pay increase for law enforcement. And maybe they did it the first one or two years, but they couldn't afterwards. So in the end, we had to make good on what was uh, mandated by law or uh, statute or regulation. So I don't know how you go around things when it says in the books that you got to pay double pay. And if you called an emergency and then called some folks to come out to work on that, then, you know, if it, if it says in the Department of Administration rules and regs is double pay, it's double pay. I don't know how you can make an executive order to countermand it because, you know, I, I figured usually rules and regulations are kind of like statute. They were, they went through the process of the AAA. They should have. So, you know, even when a, a rule and reg was implemented, it came through the law, the legal process, and a legislature would have uh, either changed it or not based on the AAA process. So I don't know how an executive order can go around that. Where's our lawyers? Where's the attorney general? Where's the public auditor? Levin, BJ, come on, boys. Get out there and start looking and doing your jobs. <laughs> You're sure as heck doing it with me. <laughs> And we're and Tina Barnes is the speaker, the super majority. Right. Boy, Regina Bisco Lee and Talina. No, Tina wasn't there. She was very mild mannered. BJ when he was there. Boy, they were a lot they were they were yelling from the highest mountain, Mount Everest. Man, they're they're what did they say? There was something said in the media not too long ago. They were quieter than than quieter than a than a church mouse. Mm. They were here to, mouses in church. That's how quiet they are. Right. So basically, you're because the governor's response has been, and I felt like she was kind of setting herself up. Her response was not that um, it's not legal, or uh, her response was, "Oh, we can't afford it." So I mean, she's admitting that, yeah, it's something that you know is mandated that the employees deserve, but it's just really not sitting well with government government of Guam employees who are first responders. Yeah. They are just so bitter about it and they feel yeah. insulted because they know what they're entitled to and yeah. for the governor to come out and bait and switch a double pay with yeah. a 25 percent, and then our directors are going to get a 15 percent, and everybody gets something hey chris that's where i'm talking that the, the comms and maybe the, the coordination there's different messages coming out and sometimes the message changes from day to day and sometimes even in one day you get a message from one official that contradicts the message from the other official that's why I'm saying there's there's a disconnect. So I'm, I'm sure you folks in the media are trying to keep up. What is the message? Right. And that's I think confusing. that's for all of us. And I'm, I'm and I'm praying, you know, as much as I'm I'm smack smacking here, I'm praying that they can fix these things, because you know what you know what are the messages, uh, and how can messages be contradictory, and either by different officials, uh, or changing from day to day. And I can understand things changing on a day to day basis, because you know uh, events evolve. But like I said, they're they're changing daily the messages, and some of them are contradictory. It's not an evolution of what's happened in terms of uh, new revelations on on this pandemic and the health or the, the economic side of it. It's just a change in con it's contradiction. Right. Yeah. And I'm seeing it from different officials. Sometimes not even from day to day, but in the same day. So I don't know. I'm Lip praying lash. for everybody. Yeah. I, I think mean, Father Paul's got to pray for us. I think I, I should I, ask him for another blessing. <laughs> but, but you're right, uh, Gov. We had the lieutenant governor come out on the show and say that the way that the governor's legal counsel handled this procurement of hotels uh, raised red flags. And then in the same day, we had the policy director say, oh, everything's cool. We're confident it'll stand up. And we had the governor then contradict her own lieutenant governor about this procurement in a press conference. So you're right. That's how many different messages. Yeah. It's a lot. But, Gov, uh, we're running against the top of the hour, so I wanted to give you the floor I don't know if uh, you and Governor Lou have a you know speaking relationship, but I, I kind of wanted to ask, and I don't know if you want to do it, but what would your advice be um, to uh, Governor Lou uh, for you know for well, what it what it's worth? I mean, this is right. your first term; you've got the experience. So, what would that be, me I, message be? I think be? right now, too, it's you know, like I said from the beginning, I was a little concerned because when I when I when I listened to the speech on the state of the island, it appeared that they 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 were a little bit slowed off the ball. And right now, when it's trying to play catch up, so I would recommend to the governor, hey, bring everybody in and, you know, um, focus on what the key issues are. Obviously, it's the pandemic and the medical side. It's the economic side and, and the human uh, condition that's uh, evolving both medically and economically for our people in Guam and businesses. Bring in all the, the experts. Bring your people in. Have a discussion. 
It's kind of like a, you know, a prism. There's, there's, you know, it all looks like one light, but in reality, when you see that light and it's split up, there's a, there's a different color. And you bring in all those perspectives, and then, and then, take a deep breath, take it all in, and using that advice, and maybe a little prayer too, you know, whether you know whatever you, you're people of faith, but a little prayer, and then make a decision, and live by that decision, and then evaluate as the decision is made, and and the course of action occurs, uh, and see how things evolve. Then bring the people again together there, and 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 decide what the next course of action is. But it's got to be multitasking. And, and by the way, delegate authority too. There's there a bunch of folks that are smart in this administration. Have them do their jobs, and if they can't do their jobs, replace them. You know, I told my directors, a director knew it's, it's time for him to be replaced when I started doing his or her job. I told him, hey guys, I'm doing your job. Once I start doing your job, I don't need you. So that's why I had a lot of turnover directors in the beginning. But, you know, that's just how it is. I think it's crazy that you, we, we, we have all these agencies and no director because they're doing quarantine duties. Yeah, I mean, is that yeah. something that you would do? I mean, it, granted, oh, it was a, a, an emergency at the time that you had to act fast, but is it something the National Guard could do? Um, I, I, I think with, um, again, everyone has a skill set. And, you know, for those, there's a lot of non-essential agencies looking at those folks and looking and evaluating the talent you have in terms of, managerial skills, uh, the ability, you know, hopefully that it ties into for what the task is at hand. And then you've got to make a value judgment as, as a leader. Okay, folks, this is what, what the game plan is. This is what, where your area of responsibility, I'm putting it there. I don't know whether putting directors in charge of, of you know, let's say um, managing people in a, in, a, in a quarantine center, and especially if you have a whole bunch of directors and deputies, uh, whether that's the best application of their skills, and especially a lot of manual type work. You know, we have a lot of workers right now in government uh, that can, you know, deliver laundry or pick up food or, or whatever, uh, or to lay us on on communications between clients or, or uh, 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 you know, folks that are under quarantine uh, and the, the decision makers on top. You, you know, you, you may not necessarily need a director or deputy director. Um, that's just my choice. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. You know, well, I, I'm sorry. As, as a former governor, and to watch how the people are suffering, and to watch how oh, the man. government is being run, I mean, you know, one I, of the tough, the homeless people kills me. You know, one of the yeah, because especially with families, one of the things we almost tried. You know, the old legislature building. Mm. We got the federal money for that. It just time ran out on us. Just kind of like the like the uh, uh, emergency transitional home for foster kids up at Barrington Heights. That, that old legislature building was supposed to be a shelter for homeless families, anyone with children. I can't stand it when I see little kids uh, uh, living under a tree. So we were supposed to put satellite offices for Department of Labor, DOE, uh, I think DISID, and but the main use of that building was supposed to be for homeless families. They come in, dinner time, they eat, they shower up, they sleep separate the men and the woman you know, with their or with their children and then they leave the next day clean it up or and then you have folks in these satellite offices to to deal with these issues some of them have uh, issues in, in getting a job some of them have disabilities some of them have drug dependency um, a lot of these weren't going to school so that's why you have these little satellite offices or representatives to deal with them but you know right now it's changed it's it, unfortunately, it's now become an office. It's for yeah, yeah, Gov, I but, covered this issue, and yeah. I, I got to tell you, that was a good plan. And what really irks me is that the homeless uh, coalition people, the advocates who who fight for these homeless people, um, had basically been yelling from the top of the mountain that this was a good idea, it was going to work, and then you had, you know, right to Bosnia Gora, I mean, just hell-bent on not letting, I mean, they were just... Saying things that That's flew in the junior. face of the data of that was there. Mistake. Hey, a uh, big mistake. If Lou had asked me about Ray Tupasna Jr., I said, oh, Lou, do you really want Ray Tupasna Jr. there in charge? But, see, that isn't me. Um, I, I, my concern, you know, there's a goal, the goal is to, I mean, two things. I think that my people, remember, actually three. Number one, you know, we've been, we've been elected. I've appointed you. Remember, we're public service. We serve the people. There's a golden rule. Treat others as you would treat them. And what's the other thing in the Bible? always look to the to, you know who are the ones closest to the good lord those that are the weakest you know the, the those that have the that are less that don't have a voice and who are the most 
folks that don't have a voice. It's either a foster kid that, that doesn't even have biologic parents to watch over them or homeless people who, you know, a lot of them are immigrants too and they don't even have a boat. So, um, you know, that's I'm hoping as we move forward that we look at the plight of, of, of those that are most vulnerable. And right the now, thousands like waiting in the grab-and-go lines. And there's 30,000 more people, you know. We Unemployed, we displaced. When I left, we were, at, we were at 4% unemployment. Remember, we came in at 13.5% unemployment. God bless the private sector. They were kicking butt in my time. We were down to uh, almost, I think when I left, it, it was under 4%. Right. Now, with, with what's happened, I wouldn't doubt that we're at 30% or higher, 40% unemployment. So there's a whole bunch of people that were used to a life where they could sustain themselves. They could look at themselves in the mirror and their parents and their families and say, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to earn a living. I'll put some food on the table. And folks, we're, we got it under control. A lot of these folks have been thrust in an area where they've never been before. It's been years since they've been there. So um, I'm praying for everybody. And, we you know, we had a comment here, uh, Gov. My side. A comment from Ochi uh, writes, that's what I miss. The prayers and the compassion every time uh, Governor Calvo speaks. I know what I know. You can't measure compassion, but in just those few sentences you strung out about the homeless people, I I don't think we've heard the same compassion from uh, Governor Lulian Guerrero. I mean, uh, I haven't heard her string more than you know a few sentences together about the homeless. I haven't heard the concern. I mean, media was just taking it to her, asking about local assistance to bridge people until federal aid uh, came and I mean, it's like she was almost getting mad that we were asking her about it yeah chris sabrina you gotta admit, the people that i had you know we had some strong personalities but I, I i massaged it into them from the very beginning you guys we were put here by the people you know let, let you remember that don't don't get in your high horse we serve the people and you know that's an important thing and and i think by and large our people you know my people you know, I've reflected that message that I did. I wanted to make sure that I am answer to the people and I work for them. You know, I've made mistakes. I'm not perfect, but um, none of us are. But we, 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 we made mistakes and, and we, we try to correct them as soon as possible. But, you know, what was the first thing we tried to do? You know, there was a big deficit. But, heck, when you have over $300 million in tax refunds that were owed to people for years, I said to our our priority is to get those things paid off. Some of the people didn't like me getting buying a bond, but I also cut pay, uh, our spending by tens of millions of dollars, and I cut our pay while we tried to pay whatever we could. But it, you know, you know how much we paid in earning income tax credit in in that short time three hundred million dollars when I was governor. Earning income tax credit, you know what that is? That's for those very same people that are waiters and and busboy attendants and people that are cleaning the uh, the linen in in a in a hotel. Those are Oh, those are the ones that are working McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. And previous governors and, and governments were paying the EITC. <laughs> Basically, uh, that's a payout to the working poor. So that, you know, from the very beginning, I'm hoping that people saw that the focus of our administration was to help and to, to serve the people uh, and to empower people. And we were going to look at the most vulnerable. And I, I think, you know, we, we, we had some successes. All right, Gov. Well, we're going to close Thank it you. out here. Thank you All so right. much for your time. Uh, we're going to keep your number handy. I don't know how much. Uh, <laughs> Anytime. God bless you. I don't know how much armchair governoring uh, this administration <laughs> can take. But hey, by the way, I'm looking at my mango tree and Silinguelas tree, full of fruits. Oh, I noticed wow. my Leguana, I finally bearing fruit. And my calamansi, I put a whole bunch of calamansi yesterday. I've become a backyard gardener. And I'm nice. right now in my backyard, and it's overcast and windy, and it was a beautiful day. And God bless the people of Guam. All right. Take All right, care. Gov. Thank you. Take care. Okay. okay. All right. So d definitely some of the takeaways uh, from the gov there. I thought it was really interesting what he said about the attorney general and the public auditor, BJ Cruz. So silent. And the legislature, right? Yeah. So, I mean, he did, uh, you know, shout out the Republican minority and at least a uh, Democrat Senator Therese Terlahi for continuing to remain mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, critical. But I think that's a good takeaway there. Checks mm -hmm. and balances. You and, know what and I mean? And just so people are clear, like we didn't, uh, he didn't call and ask to come on the show. Yeah. We kind of just wanted to get, since we spoke with him, what, a month and uh, early a on. A couple months, yeah. Yeah, just to get his feedback and, and as being a former governor. 
I mean, so. we don't got, yeah, it's important perspective. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's the same thing we did with uh, Congress delegates to Nicholas and bringing in former Congressman Robert, Robert Underwood. Underwood. It's yeah. like you bring in people who have done the job mm-hmm. and you get their perspective on it. It's pretty basic. Uh, 902, let's uh, keep it on the phones here. And we want to go to Tim Wooding Tumon Harmon with uh, Mayor Louise Rivera. Uh, good morning, Mayor. Hi, Mayor. Half a day, good morning, Sabrina and Chris. 